Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to another CP Solvers Residency Program BMR. We are very happy today to have Bill Krugman here uh, discussing a case with Dr. Ravi. But let's start introducing everyone. Dr. Cody, welcome. He's a program director. Program director. And we would like to hear about yourself, introduce yourself, and what do you like doing for fun? Uh, good morning, everybody, and really nice to meet y'all. Um, I'm actually one of the chief residents at Baylor. Uh, my name is my name's Cody. I'm originally from Houston, so I'm a Texas born and raised individual. Um, a little bit about me, I'll be doing my GI fellowship at Baylor next year. And I guess things I like to do for fun, do uh, weekly trivia with a group of residents and like trying new food, which uh, Houston is abundant in. And outside the hospital, what do you like doing? Yeah, outside the hospital, um, trying new foods, definitely, uh, seeing what's new in Houston, and then uh, weekly trivia is, is my go-to. Okay. Uh, let's see. Dr. Fahim is going to be our discussant today with Dr. Ravi. Uh, I will try, again, not to call you doctor, but it's the IMG custom here. I, may, I think many of us will understand. Please introduce yourself. Uh, what do you like to do for fun? Good morning, everybody. My name is Fahim. I'm one of the third year internal medicine residents at Baylor College of Medicine. I was originally born in Karachi, Pakistan, but I moved here when I was seven years old and I've been in Texas for the last 20 something years of my life. So very much consider myself a Texan. I went to medical school at Baylor and then I decided to stay for internal medicine residency at Baylor College of Medicine just because I loved it so much. Um, I'm Next year, I will be one of the chief medical residents. Uh, so we'll be serving in a role that Cody and Phil are already doing right now, and then hopefully applying for a cardiology fellowship afterwards. Um, outside of the hospital, gosh, well, I, I love coming home every single weekend. My parents are in Friendswood, which is a close enough city right next to Houston, and love seeing my cats. I like reading books. I, If any of you guys have a Kindle, you guys know that you guys can download like dozens of books on it, uh, if not more. Uh, so um, during third year, especially, I've had a lot more time to um, get back into reading. So I'm really enjoying that. Amazing. That's really cool. Next is our case presenter, Dr. Alekia. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Alekia. I'm a PGY2 resident at Beta College of Medicine. A bit of background about me. I grew up in the UK and I studied medicine there as well. I studied medicine at the University of Cambridge. And after graduating, I worked as an academic foundation doctor in the NHS in London. And then I moved here for residency to Houston and I couples matched here. Um, things I like to do in my spare time. I like traveling. I like exploring nature. I like exploring new trails and hiking. Wow, that's amazing. I'm super, I, I am like, I admire like uh, boss ladies here. Um, amazing to know that my favorite book is Neverwhere by Neil Gaiman. We should have to like uh, read it definitely. And next is our case discussion, Dr. Ravi. Would you give us some words before starting our case? Some words, what words would you like, my friend? Any I words? Oh, like something for all the IMGs and medical students joining today. Yeah, you know, um, uh, I, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. It's a real honor. I have so many, uh, so many thoughts, a lot of, uh, a lot of new faces that I'm trying to get to know and thrilled that they're joining us today. Gratitude to you and Deborah for organizing this. Um, do you have a, do you, Yaz, do you know how, um, how many programs or roughly how many programs you've had so far? Actually, I yeah. feel very proud to present that we have 17 programs. Oh my gosh. Already, uh, like in our list, uh, we have like a couple more hoping that they, after they see this amazing stellar Chris presentation, we'll be like, yes, I definitely want to. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Oh, yeah. I, I have to be honest though, I know that we have many very special programs, but Baylor has always had a very special place in my heart in large part because I feel like CP Solvers has had inadvertently been associated with UCSF because of the sheer number of us, but um, I think close and uh, not 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 a too distant second is the strong association between CP Solvers and Baylor, and I think that's most made most famous by our beloved Seth and and Zavin uh, initially, but more and more and more and more uh, recently. Uh, 
our reside brothers and i know alec wasn't able to i don't think i see him here today um but this the overlap between Baylor and cp solvers is really strong so it's a real real delight that i get to be here um and i'm excited to share the stage uh with uh many cool people especially fahim who he doesn't know he may not know this but but him and i um probably were physically located in the same country for at least seven years of his life um uh, because i grew up in lahore pakistan not too far oh, away wow. from pakistan yeah so if at if at any point I don't know if you still speak Urdu or you I would imagine that you speak it at home to some extent. Um, yeah, this rate. Um, so if you ever need to ever need to duck low and speak some Urdu, <laughs> we can definitely do that too. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I, I speak fluent Urdu. My parents awesome. are very uh, strong proponents of speaking Urdu at home. So yeah, uh, if I ever need a get get out of jail free card. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. And a special welcome to Cody and a, a special welcome to Elika and anyone else who's joining us from Baylor. It's really, it's a real treat. I'm curious, uh, Fahim, what uh, um, what inspired you to want to go in blind in this case? So I think, I, I mean, one of the main reasons why I decided to stay at Baylor and especially one of the main reasons why I decided to apply for uh, the chief medical resident position, I'm very thankful and grateful that I have, uh, was selected was the te teaching aspect. And the if anybody's been at Baylor, been able to you know sit in one of our morning report sessions, I mean, morning reports is such a lively discussion uh, in a very safe environment in which you get to discuss you know this clinical case that nobody else has heard about uh, with your peers, with amazing faculty like Alec, um, um, Dr. Steph, Dr. Uh, Zavin. I mean, amazing, amazing folks. So going in blind, I think it's just the right way to do it. Uh, it's going to be a little bit, uh, yes, it's a little bit da daunting and intimidating, um, but I've got the support of you. I've got the support of everybody else in this room uh, who's, I know, will uh, be more than happy to chime in uh, if I get lost. No chance you get lost, my friend, because if we're both lost, then uh, that then by definition, we're not lost. If we're, all, if we're all lost together. I'm curious. Um, yeah, poor Yaz made the bad decision of giving me the mic to talk, and I probably won't give it back to her at any point. Um, I'm curious um, in terms of like plotting out our discussion. Um, how have you worked with Aleka before? Have you overlapped clinically? Yes, Alekia was actually one of my interns uh, when I was a second year, second year awesome. medicine resident. Yeah. Awesome. What did you feel like she was gravitating towards? Any specialties or any like vibes that we can start to anticipate? Oh, Alekia has been, I'm pretty sure from birth possibly has been 100% uh, dead set on cardiology. Oh, okay. Correctly, okay. If I remember correctly, it's heart failure. <laughs> Alika, is that true? Yeah, that's true. I'm interested in cardiology. Not sure what within it yet, uh, but definitely cardiology. And how did that interest come about? I enjoyed physiology at school, at medical school. I enjoyed my physiology lectures. I like problem solving, thinking through right. things. Uh, I enjoyed all my cardiology rotations. I like doing procedures. So it was, it was a really good fit. Amazing. No, that makes Everything a lot of sense. Everything that I like about medicine. Right. You can really anchor all of cardiology and fundamental principles, which is so, so cool. I completely get that. I'm curious, what got you to uh, what got you to consider moving over to the U.S.? It's a rare, rare move, and we're very glad you made it. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so I moved here with my husband. We couples matched here in Houston. I see. The things that drew me to Houston, the things that drew me to Baylor uh, is one of the one of the good, really great things about our program is its location itself in the Texas mm. Medical Center, which yeah. is actually the largest medical center in the world. Uh, there's a huge density of hospitals mm -hmm. there, which brings with it the diversity in the pathologies and the patients that we see. Whatever your interests are, they will be met here. Mm -hmm. um, Houston is also a diverse city. It's actually the most diverse city in the U.S. Really? Uh, and again, that sort of reflects in our training and the diversity of patients that we treat and see in our hospitals. And another great thing about Baylor is that it's an academic institution. We train at four different hospitals, a um, wide uh, range of sort of clinical settings and hospital uh, dynamics. We have the VA, Bentar, which is our safety net hospital, St. Luke's, which gives us the exposure to sort of a private uh, mm. hospital setting and MD Anderson as well, which is sort of world renowned for its uh, pioneering research as well. Oh my gosh, if they're not so paying just... to sponsor them, they really, really <laughs> should 
this point. That's unreal. That's so, so cool. I'll ask you one more question before we move on because I know we got to get a case too, but just, I'm curious how you feel about GI. I, I, that's my favorite question to ask car, future cardiologists is how they feel about GI. How do, what, what are your feelings towards GI, would you say? I think it's a great specialty. I like medicine as a whole. I think I've had uh, such a good uh, training so far and mm-hmm. Yeah, whatever specialty you choose within medicine, I think it's really important to remember that we're an internist at heart and appreciate the diversity that internal medicine offers. Yeah. So I think GI is a great specialty. I, I like it as a rotation. You're going to be a great cardiologist. Too many scopes, I would yeah. say. <laughs> there we go. Finally, In something interest, to too much about GI. Involved. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, wonderful. It's so, so nice to meet you. I'm excited to um, share the stage with you both and discuss this case. And um I'm curious if we're going to talk a little cards or not, but thanks for the, 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 uh, at least the teaser that it may happen. All right. We're, we're ready whenever you are. Great. So the chief complaint is a 44 year old male with prior history of diabetes presenting with a generalized progressive swelling for the past few months. All right. Okay. With that hint in mind, I'm curious. I mean, what are you thinking? What thoughts crossed your mind? So I mean, the the differential itself right now is quite broad because we have a 45-year-old gentleman with generalized progressive swelling uh, for the past like couple of months, so cr- chronic ideology. So in that sense, in somebody with diabetes, there are, I, I don't know whether it's presumably controlled diabetes or uncontrolled diabetes, but that in itself is a risk factor for a myriad of different conditions. So swelling to me um, manifests as couple of different organs that I'm thinking about, especially generalized swelling. So almost like an anisarchic picture. So whether this is related to a cardiac physiology, whether this gentleman is just diffusely volume overloaded, just from a cardiac dysfunction for which, you know, if he has ischemic heart disease, secondary diabetes, that may be the case. Or if um, if he's now in sort of a cardiorenal syndrome or any just like a renal physiology leading to, again, diffuse swelling, diffuse anisarchic kind of picture, possibly secondary from uncontrolled diabetes, or whether this is like a liver issue, whether this is cirrhosis that was either undiagnosed or diagnosed if you get further information from uh, Alekia regarding that. So, and then of course, other ideologies, endocrine and metabolic, all those things causes to some degree, generalized swelling. So things such as, you know, hypothyroidism, you know, we get the whole myxedema, uh, myxedematous sort of picture, uh, any kind of protein deficiency, whether lost through the urine because you have some sort of nephrotic or some sort of CKD kind of picture, or whether you have some sort of like protein losing enteropathy, uh, which predisposes you to just sort of, you know, an anisarchy picture from that in respect also. So for right now, I think the differential uh, is quite broad and involves you know quite a new, quite a, quite a lot of uh, organ systems. I completely agree with you. I think that the truth is, is what you're saying, which is so comprehensive, is that when when we often say the differential is broad and we list a large number of accurate things, the question for us in real time is. Is that really when we're engaged in a differential diagnosis? And I think that the point that you're making up by bringing up, quite honestly, is that when you when we are inclined to say the differential diagnosis is broad, I think the action steps are that it's probably not a good time to engage in the said differential diagnosis. Otherwise, in real life, you're sitting there thinking about 100 different things paralyzed by the sheer possibility. So your list is very thorough and very accurate, and as you point out, quite long making it very hard for you to act on that hypothesis. So I'm curious of that long list that you have, if you sort of freeze the moment where this is literally all you know, what kinds of action steps are you generating to help you filter that differential diagnosis and make progress, to make it a little bit more digestible for the uh, cognitive challenge in the moment? What do you think? So things that would help sort of prioritize the differential in a much more most likely to least likely, yeah. definitely right now, I think history, history is king. Um, the chronicity of this um, ideology. And I think for myself, the associated symptoms, if we're getting a picture of, you know, progressive dyspnea exertion or, or an orthopnic kind of picture, I'm more prone to think, okay, maybe this is a cardiac issue. Maybe I should be in my sense, not to anchor, but just prioritize that sort of that side of the differential. If yeah. we're thinking about, hey, he's been traveling or he has been having diarrhea for you know the last couple of months, 
maybe that's another issue that we need to think about whether this is approaching listen enteropathy. So right now, I think before we jump into like, you know, vials or labs or even yeah. start to think about what we would be ordering, um, yeah. history, history is king. I completely agree with you. And I think that to focus in on that, we don't know the HPI yet, but I love re reflecting on the fact that the patient chooses to emphasize some things over others, right? When we ask the patient to do a chief concern and then to talk about the HPI, we're asking the patient to triage, no different than what we triage. And the patient has triaged that the edema is generalized well before he has mentioned anything else. So I'm curious, what significance do you draw from the fact that this person is having swelling in his arms without yet mentioning that he's short of breath? Does that do anything for you? Oh, definitely. I think that uh, that decreases the likelihood of things like heart failure uh, for me. Uh, but again, it doesn't rule out an asarchic from other sort of ideologies. Most commonly in, in the patients that I've seen are from uh, a renal dysfunction, whether mm. that's chronic or, acute or more like a subacute picture, uh, liver dysfunction, you know, cirrhosis, oh. any kind of um, just from a hypoalbuminemic state, just from a hypo sort of production of albumin or some other endocrine or metabolic cause. Yeah, superb. I completely agree with you. I think that the kidney tends to to be much more prominent at the surface than it is viscerally. And that's in stark contrast to the heart and the and the liver, which leave a visceral imprint either in the chest, usually the heart, and in the abdomen with the liver. And of course, these are generalizations with numerous exceptions. But if we take the sheer weight of water distribution and compare heart, liver, and kidney, and the heart, it settles in the chest, and the liver, it settles in the abdomen, and in the kidney, it settles on the surface. And the disproportionate amount that's settling on the surface here is a powerful clue to the presence of the kidney problem. It helps you skew that differential. And in fact, um, if we play real realistic, there's no way that you know this information without knowing the vital signs in real life. We do this as an exercise, but um, your, a, a colleague of yours, likely a nurse, will, will have triaged the patient already obtained vital signs for you. So let's play a little game. So if, if I tell you the blood pressure is 190 over 110, what do you think the chances of that be of what do you think that does to the odds of this being cirrhosis? But it's likely, likely low, likely low, or low on my differential because I mean, cirrhosis yeah. exposes you to sort of a baso dilated state. That's how you get the yeah. symptom or the, the clinical signs of um, like the spider and um, sure. or the palmar erythema. You're in a vasodilatory state just because of decreased uh, excretion or removal of those kind of sort of like pro-vasodilatory compounds in a patient with cirrhosis. Um, but if they're hypertensive, I'm thinking, is this sort of like a mixed nephritic or nephrotic uh, yeah. issue in which you're having hypertensive um, blood pressures uh, due to, again, the primary renal pathology? Yeah, superb. You know, in my mind, I think you're absolutely right that history in this patient is so powerful, but in the place that I practice, I get to talk to the patient and glance over the vital signs at the same time. They're happening in the same room, which I feel really lucky. So I'll tell you what honestly happens in these circumstances, which are probably once a week for me, and to see somebody anasarchic once a week or once every other week. And I and I like walk in the room and I it's obvious, you know, you see the anasarch, and then I glance over at the at the blood pressure and the respiratory rate. Um, and I think you can make a tremendous amount of progress with that information and to share that now to see if it actually applies in this case when we get that data later on, is the hypertension vir virtually incompatible with cirrhosis. So that's gone. Um, it is totally plausible to have hypertension, hypertension and heart failure. In fact, uncontrolled hypertension is the second most common cause of heart failure in the United States. But what happens with hypertensive cardiomyopathy is the biventricular cardiomyopathy, which will almost always involve the lungs. And that's why I look at the blood pressure and I look at the respiratory rate. And if the blood pressure to the respiratory rate is super, super high, meaning that the blood pressure is through the roof and the patient is not impacted in a respiratory status whatsoever, I'm dying to see the serum albumin and the creatinine. I cannot wait for it because I bet you that's abnormal. But in a patient with heart failure, it can totally be high, but you'll see the consequences here. It can't hide. The most obvious form is not hypoxemia. The most obvious form is resting tachypnea. Patients have moving air, moving air, air. So I completely agree with you. I think the history will be very, very informative, but I want to make that nuanced point that the vitals that you obviously have at this point tell a powerful, powerful story. But as we listen to the history, I think we'll have to listen to how much of the fluid is in the body versus in, in, the, in the cavities of the body versus on the surface. And I think fine tuning that help us a lot. Any thoughts or questions come come to your mind before we get more information? 
Not not especially. I think okay, cool. <laughs> after cool. after the history, I'll I'll be in a better place to figure out what gaps I need to fill. Yeah. Uh, by the way, is a, a little bit of a, a a little bit of a um, sneak preview into the into the mind of the facilitator that does this every day, almost every other on average every other day. And the first aquat, I take the time to figure out like at what level I'm going to have a conversation with you, and it's very clear that you've established that we are having a conversation at the uh, colleague level um, to the point where I'm um, passing on these fairly, I would say. Uh, high level pearls. So I'm excited to continue the conversation um, with yeah. a future chief. And it's very, very obvious. All right, you tell us more, please. I like you. He was in his usual state of health until one year ago. He presented to his PCP with fatigue and was diagnosed with diabetes. His A1C at that time was 14. He was started on metformin and gliburide. And despite being compliant with these medications, he continued to feel poorly with progressive fatigue and generalized weakness. He also reports generalized body aches that are most noticeable in his hips, knees, and hands. In the past few months, he started to develop swelling. It started firstly in his legs, but is now everywhere, including his abdomen. He also has some abdominal distension and discomfort and increasing shortness of breath and exertion. He was no longer able to continue with his work as a construction worker and quit his job one month ago. He also reports to have lost more than 100 pounds unintentionally in the past year, despite having a good appetite. He went to his PCP one month ago and was prescribed furosemide, but was not given a diagnosis. On review systems, he doesn't report any headaches, no chest pain, orthopnea or PND, no cough, no changes in his urinary or bowel habits, no fevers or chills, no joint swelling, no skin changes that he noted, and has had no recent travel or sick contacts. Just going through the rest of the history as well, just rounding things off. Uh, his home meds, he takes metformin, gliburide, furosemide, and multivitamins. For his social history, he worked as a construction worker mainly in roofing uh, and doesn't report any specific industrial exposures. No pets at home. He drinks maybe two to three beers per day, doesn't smoke and doesn't use any drugs. He doesn't report any drug allergies, medication allergies. And going through his family history, he reports that his paternal uncle had similar swelling problems. He's unsure of the exact cause, but does know that he takes some water pills. His father has diabetes. His mother also has diabetes and hypertension. He doesn't have any siblings and he has two children who are 10 and six, both in good health. Yeah, this is, I feel like you're presenting like a master so smoothly and was really, uh, really, really interesting information. Um, I think Fahim, when, when there's so much data coming our way, it's actually a little bit tricky to articulate to folks listening what you're prioritizing and what you find the most valuable. So I think before we start to analyze it, it probably is helpful for people to hear um, how you're rating the data in terms of its importance. So um, if you just take a second to think about what piece of data do you think carries the most diagnostic weight in terms of the stuff you've heard so far? Or like top two or three, you know, it doesn't have to be the top one. Like, what do you feel like is real? Are the real heavyweights here? So this gentleman has a myriad, like an absolute myriad of symptoms and signs that he's coming in with. Unfortunately, for for at least for us, uh, during this hypothetical sort of morning report scenario, the, a lot of his symptoms are nonspecific. Nonspecific right. in the sense that I'm not quite sure what I would be in terms of, again, it would be a very, I would be going back to square one in terms of the differential if I were to hone in on just fatigue or weakness or body aches. Uh, or you know shortness of breath it would be again differentials are very broad but i think if we keep in mind that the bothersome issue or the reason why he went back to sort of uh, the pcp and what the medication he got was was this swelling um which is a more subacute chronic more well at least a more recent issue in terms of this one year episode i would say that again swelling is the thing that we can 
in terms of differential, uh, have a pretty clear differential because very few, very few things will cause, you know, differential at least as least compared to weakness or generalized fatigue or generalized body aches. Those things have a much more broad differential in my mind. So the swelling is something I'm still focusing on. But again, we have to frame it. It's, it's helpful to frame that in the other in the other sort of accompanying symptoms. So most notably the 100 pound weight loss and especially the lack of some of the things that we've seen on ROS in the sense of lack of PND, lack of uh, dyspneonic surgeon, if I'm right, or did he have dyspneonic surgeon? Oh, well, he did. Uh, so lack of orthopnea, lack of PND, lack of any kind of uh, changes in Oh my God, as the wisdom was flowing, the internet interfered. Huh, let's give him a second, okay? Oh, did we lose Fahim? I think we might have. Oh, there you are. Hello. Got him back. Yeah, I don't know what happened. <laughs> You know, both you, I, I think you froze and then uh, for some reason our screen vanished. Um, the uh, the Zoom powers that be uh, were like, wait, too much wisdom flowing my way. Um, but I'm not Did sure. You, uh, I don't know if Deborah yeah, is going to help with. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Deborah. All right. Wait, we lost you at when you were starting to talk about the 100 pound weight loss. Uh, or you, so you can just like pick it up from wherever you feel. It's a, yeah. a trick. Yeah. Yeah, so in my mind, I'm still thinking, prioritizing uh, swelling as the cardinal symptom that I would help formulate a differential around. Um, mm -hmm. But again, contextualizing this now with a lot of sort of expected symptoms that we may have been expecting based on our prior discussion before we got all this inf new information, but and also some other information that I would personally would not have been expecting in terms of a hundred pound weight loss, body aches. Those are things that I'm that do not fit into my sort of clinical schema when it comes to typical things like we were talking about in terms of uh, you know a renal dysfunction or cardiac dysfunction or uh, sort of like a liver dysfunction. I think that's absolutely superb. I agree with you that like there's so many things that are non-specific, and we probably will have a harder time translating those things into more actionable uh, uh, findings. But I think we'll have a high high chance of turning the swelling into a more specific, rigorous label, like nephrotic syndrome or cirrhosis or heart failure. And that rigorous label will then allow us to figure out what the non what the value add of those non-specific things. So if we find that the patient has a high CK causing the myalgias and the body aches and has heart failure, we might think, oh, does he have a, a muscle issue that's affecting the skeletal or the cardiac muscle? If we learn that the, the um, that, that in fact, the body aches represent um, uh, a bony pathology from a low phosphorus and he has kidney issues, we might be like, okay, what's the overlap between low phosphorus and a kidney issue? So I think that um, the progress is definitely going to be be on the, on the, um, on the presumed anasarca. But I think just to point out some things that seem to be apparently at odds with each other, there's two things that are clashing. Having anasarca with weight loss fundamentally means that you have more weight loss than you realize. So if he's actually lost 100 pounds of body mass, he's lost way more than that in terms of, uh, of muscle and uh, of non-body, non-water body weight because he's certainly gained 20 to 30 pounds based on his fluid. So let's just ask, let's just emphasize that this person has probably lost 130 to 40 pounds. That's crazy. Um, and then the other thing is the, the, the clash between diabetes and weight loss. And I think that second clash is a little bit less intuitive. Um, but diabetes means that insulin is not working enough. And if insulin is not working enough, it means your patient has to lose weight. And at first glance, that's a very counterintuitive thought because we all know that patients with type 2 diabetes, weight gain accompanies that. So let's take a moment to explain that paradox. If you are developing diabetes, your insulin is working less, so you are going to lose weight. However, the driver of insulin resistance, the driver of the insulin not working in the vast majority of patients is increased adiposity. So it creates a little bit of a counterintuitive loop. You, you gain weight, so your insulin doesn't work as well, and you lose a little bit of weight, but net net, you gain more weight. So here, the presence of profound weight loss along with diabetes points to a, an atypical mechanism 
of diabetes. It, it eliminates the most common cause of diabetes, which is insulin resistance driven by increased adiposity. As most people with this very classic mechanism of diabetes lose weight, their diabetes gets better. We don't know his current status of his, of his diabetes, but I think that that initial disconnect with him having an A1C of 14 in the context of weight loss should make us think of other mechanisms of insulin, uh, 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 of ineffective insulin. The most common one would be to start to wonder, is it not a resistance problem, but actually a production problem, be it from type one diabetes, the most common, but many other uh, focal pancreatic issues. So I'd say that there are a lot of things at odds here. Um, Anasarco with weight loss and weight loss with uh, uh, diabetes, those things clash and they are probably profound, because they are so unusual, they're probably a profound clue uh, to the ultimate diagnosis. I think there also is a th little theme here of a family history, but let's get a little bit more data to see if that is either a core piece of data or a non-specific entity that will not merge into the final diagnosis. All right, Alikia, we're ready for your next dialogue. But thank you. Great. Going through his vitals, his temperature was 99.4, heart rate was 90, blood pressure was 90 over 60, respiratory rate was 20, and he was saturating 95% on room air. His BMI is 17. On general appearance, he looks chronically ill, cachectic, with temporal wasting. On AGNT, he had no sclera lecturus, normal conjunctiva, moist mucous membranes, and no cervical lymphadenopathy. On cardiovascular exam, he had normal rate, regular rhythm, warm and well perfused peripheries, palpable peripheral pulses, a laterally displaced point of maximal impulse, and no appreciable JVP elevation. His lungs were clear to auscultation bilaterally. His abdomen was soft, distended, non-tender, normal bowel sounds with no appreciable organomegaly, and he had a positive fluid wave. On neurological exam, he was alert and oriented times four, normal cranial upper extremity and lower extremity exams with normal strength, sensation, and reflexes bilaterally. And he had a normal gait, and there was mild asterixis bilaterally. On extremities, he had three plus pitting edema all the way up to his thighs. There were no obvious joint changes, no joint erythema, warmth or swelling, and he had no skin rashes. And maybe while I'm is thinking, um, I'll just ask Alikia, yeah, and did he have any edema in his arms or was it just really pronounced in his legs? He had some edema in his arms as well. I see. And if you could just give us a sense of was the edema in the arms of similar magnitude to the legs or were the legs way more impressive? I think the legs were uh, more impressive. Understood. Definitely more noticeable in the legs. Gotcha. Thank you very much. That's very, very helpful. Thank you. All right. Yeah. What are your thoughts? So impressive, impressive clinical exam. And the things that, well, like we were talking about before is his one BMI. Um, if I was, if I got that right, that was 17. Was that right, Alakia? Yeah, BMI was yeah. 17. So BMI of 17. So very, very malnourished uh, gentleman. Hypotension, 90 over 60. And he lo looks chronically ill. And in the sense that we have now some negative exam findings that really lure some things on our differentials. For example, having a normal uh, lung sounds, no crackles, no evidence of uh, no JVD distension, no like jugular venous distension. So things that I'm thinking of more of like a central cause of such as a cardiac pathology are, are less likely. The fact that his PMI is laterally displaced, something to keep in the back in the mind. But I'm thinking now right now is that the fact that he has a positive fluid wave. So aside he's on exam, he has pitting edema, both, I mean, greater than legs, but legs um, and arms are involved. Interestingly enough, no sclerolicturus, no sort of rashes, no skin changes, uh, nothing slam dunk for that this man is a decompensated uh, patient with decompensated cirrhosis. So overall, I'm sort of trying to reconcile this physical exam with our prior sort of paradoxical history of edema, but with overall weight loss and a relatively late diagnosis 
of diabetes in the sense that he's 44 years old. If he's been following up with his PCP regularly, is it possible that he had diabetes all along and it's just uncontrolled or whether this is more of an acute uh, or more recent diagnosis along with the sort of the body aches and the weakness that he's feeling? Uh, I still, common things mean common. We still have to rule out the common things that we see in the hospital, such as um, cirrhosis or any kind of like renal pathology. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, is there a larger overarching syndrome or phenomenon that's involving multiple systems, the heart, the liver, um, possibly the kidneys? Um, is there something, or that could also explain sort of the chronic symptoms of body aches and the A1C of 14 in the context of possibly like a normal uh, normal uh, patient otherwise. So, and that in itself sort of begs towards um, autoimmune pathology, whether this is sort of like a sequelae of a larger autoimmune condition. And that would make sense in the sense that his uh, uncle also had similar symptoms. So is there something uh, that's, is there a phenomenon that involves the liver and the heart um, that can manifest in edema? Definitely, there are multiple infiltrative diseases, um, you know, hereditary hemochromatosis or other pathologies. And 44-year-old gentlemen, other things such as, you know, sarcoid or something else are, are less likely. But things to keep in the back of my mind that, um, so again, atypical or less common causes of heart, liver, and possibly endocrine slash metabolic dysfunction um, need to be discussed and uh, considered. You know, I completely agree with you. I think that um, I think this uh, exam is profoundly impactful. And I mean, if you had to, if you had to, as you said, uh, guided by your principles, common things being common, when you see edema, especially um, uh, edema that's this prominent, you have to go heart, liver, kidney every time. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your instinct in terms of how you're rating them in order of the most likely to the least likely of heart, liver, kidney? What would you say based on the exam? Probably the cardiac etiologies are probably the least likely in, in this patient right now, just because of his uh, normal respiratory exam. He's sat saturating well. Well, again, like we said, biventricular dysfunction, you're going to, by the time that you have overall, unless he had isolated right ventricular dysfunction, which is less common, um, but biventricular dysfunction will, just because path, how pathophysiologically the way that it works, it's just a tube. Like you're going to have edema right. in the lungs first, and then you're going to manifest with generalized edema. So that in itself is less likely. That being said, things such as cirrhosis and um, our cirrhosis and renal dysfunction right now are possible or yeah. are possible. Um, I would probably edge on the fact that if we're not seeing hepatomegaly, though my clinical example of hepatomegaly is notorious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't take my word on it. Um, but either of those things in my mind uh, or both, if we're talking about a sort of like an overarching phenomenon are possible right now. Yeah, I think that I appreciate your caveat of like the idea it could be and instead of or heart, liver, or kidney be an and is very plausible. And the truth is there is evidence for heart involvement because the PMI is displaced laterally, but you're not inclined to assign a tremendous amount of significance to that. Um, I'd also uh, venture to say that asterixis would be very, very unusual with a heart failure in a patient with a low BMI. You can get obesity driven heart failure conditions come with asterixis from the hypercarbia that that also comes with. But um, asterixis points to a metabolic cause of volume overload in the liver or the kidney. What if you use the blood pressure as a gauge? Do you find the, a soft blood pressure more consistent with liver or more consistent with kidney? I'm biased uh, just because we see a lot of cirrhosis patients in, yeah. in Luke's or VA. So cirrhosis uh, mm -hmm. is, I've seen it quite commonly that patients who have that with decompensed cirrhosis have um, hypertension, you know, they require metadrine and other sort of. Uh, yeah. Like, my friend, it's only a bias if you're if it's only a bias if you're wrong. And I don't think you are. <laughs> a definition of a bias means that you were led astray. Otherwise, you're using data wisely. I agree with you. I think that most patients with kidney dysfunction with this degree were working hard to control their blood pressure because the RAS system is so pathologically activated. So for me, I think this is uh, it's probably liver, 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 and then maybe kidney and heart. But there are things that are inconsistent with the liver, like, as you mentioned, the lack of jaundice. Um, so we'll have to see what the what the um, LFTs are, but I'm really, really inclined to um, study the signature of hepatic disease in this person first to help us clarify uh, what it might be because regular old liver diseases do not come with weakness, body aches, 100 pound intentional weight loss, and uncontrolled diabetes. 
Um, my advice to everybody listening is there is no way that you can write a diagnosis right now on the whiteboard without having a 50% chance of needing to erase it. And I think we need to start to be very, very deliberate about when it is wise to start to think about individual diagnoses. Right now, this case is so, so, so foggy that with more and more exposure to clinical reasoning, the more and more you realize that you should not entertain individual diagnoses right now. The problem is too nebulous for specific answers to be profound diagnostic thoughts in real time. If you're taking care of this patient in real time and you're thinking of individual diagnoses, you've just wasted five seconds of your time. I promise you, because you need to think about how to understand this issue. And I think understanding this issue will probably begin with scrutinizing our leading hypothesis to litter liver better. And if it turns out to be truly hepatic, then I think we can really start to be like, okay, how does this case unfold? So that's my biggest piece of advice. Individual diagnoses right now, they're literally like gonna either, uh, you're gonna hit a home run and feel lucky, but I think you're missing out on the art of what it's like to take care of this patient in real life, which is solve the problem, clarify the problem before you try to solve it. And right now we're definitely in problem clarification mode. Um, and for more information to help us do that, uh, I'll give you back the, the mic uh, like you. Yeah. So going through his labs, uh, CBC first, white count was 5.5, 69% neutrophils, 24% lymphocytes, and no eosinophilia. His hemoglobin was 12.4 with an MCV of 98, and platelets are 130. Going through his BMP and CMP, sodium was 132, potassium was 4.9, chloride was 86, bicarb was 31, BUN 18, creatinine 0.6, glucose 281, AST was elevated 93, ALT 83, ALP 163, GGT 190, total bilirubin 1, direct bilirubin 0 0.3, total protein 8.3, albumin 3.6, calcium was 9.5, magnesium was 2.2, INR was 1.1, PT was 15, and PTT 30. His BNP was elevated, more than 3,000, TSH was 1.2. His UA was negative with no proteins, nitrates, white cells, or RBCs. His A1C was 14. I feel like we're on a roller coaster ride here, Fane. What are your thoughts now? <laughs> So, I mean, that really takes care, or at least to some extent, uh, lowers some other things in my differential. So based on the exam findings, we've already lowered our, um, lowered our sort of um, concern for a primary cardiac pathology. With the BMP, with the creatinine of you know, 0.6 UA, that in of itself did not show any kind of protein, um, again, less likely again for again, that lowers the sort of renal dysfunction or a chronic or like a primary renal pathology on the differential also. Of course, you know, the UA protein versus a 24-hour urine protein collection is slightly different in exactly what they're measuring, but uh, those things again are a little bit less likely. The BNANCY being greater than 3,000 volume overloaded state. I mean, the way that I understand BNANCP, it's due to stretch, predominantly, you know, atrial stretch. Um, so it's interesting that he has a B and NCP that greater than 3000, but again, his chest sounds are completely clear. He is on labs, otherwise hyponatremic, um, hypothrombocytic, like thromb thrombocytopenic, uh, mildly alkalotic. His uh, LFTs with the AST and ALT in being like relatively high um, are concerning for possibly like, again, a smoldering chronic liver dysfunction. The thing that I'm surprised by, honestly, is the fact that his 
total protein is 8.3 and his albumin is 3.6. Um, that also lowers um, things such as like a sort of a protein losing protein losing conditions such as like a protein losing enteropathy or a protein wasting through the kidneys less likely just because I don't really associate um, anasarca due to a sort of a lack of an osmotic uh, pressure because of the lack of albumin or other uh, proteins um, to be occurring at a protein level at albumin level of 3.6 it just to me doesn't uh, quite fit in the schema that I'm looking at so overall like again decompensated cirrhosis um it's not fitting the picture he does he's not supremely coagulopathic uh he's not supremely hypoalbuminemic um the if the liver is completely burnt out then yes we can see sort of even like normal or low ast alts um but it's not completely fitting a primary cirrhosis picture also so it's again begs the question of this patient has an A1C of 14 right now, uh, despite being on diabetic medications for the last year or so. Um, he has some other derangements that are still concerning in the sense of hyponatremia, um, mild alkalosis on sort of like with a bicarb of 31. Am I looking at sort of a overall phenomenon, overall syndrome, something and something endocrine, something autoimmune related that's causing these issues? But that's that's um that's what I'm thinking right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, my mind is going in circles, and I think it's very very hard to um to make concrete progress. And I think it's goes to show you just the power of these clinical reasoning exercises to analyze each data. Like not um at the moment in real life, you'd probably get all this data in one go, and you'd probably think, oh, the BNP is three thousand, the liver stuff is norm relatively normal, and the creatinine and the albumin are normal, so this is heart failure. But you would lose out on the topsy turvy journey that we just went uh, went on. But I think it's hard not to say with a BNP of three thousand and relatively underwhelming liver uh, labs and relatively underwhelming kidney stuff that the heart is not your first glance, <laughs> uh, and um. And having to analyze that in thoughtful detail. And now, if we go back and we, you know, we look at the family history, and we're like, we know a lot of uh, there are a lot of congenital cardiomyopathies, especially idiopathic familial dilated cardiomyopathy that transmit familially. We also now have to scrutinize his alcohol use. Two to three beers every day is not a small amount, mm -hmm. and how, what that has to play. Um, so I think that you know I, what what I would probably do in real life is uh, I would probably get an. Um, uh, I would probably uh, do an ultrasound to a point of care ultrasound to see how much ascites he has and to tap that, because if we can prove that that's cardiogenic ascites, we can really make a lot of progress with um, understanding the nature of the volume overload. And for cardiogenic ascites, it would be it would meet criteria for portal hypertension for a, with a SAG of one point one. And but the clue to the cardiac involvement will be a total protein of greater than two point five. And if we find those things, we can really hurdle towards the heart. And before we dissect the heart in more detail, I think you always want to know what is the EKG? What are the electrocardiographic fingerprints of the disease? And what are the echocardiographic fingerprints of the disease? So what's missing now is high confidence on the fact that it's the heart, which I think would be accelerated in many ways, a point of care ultrasound and a diagnostic paracentesis. Uh, an EKG, an echo. And if we really build the case for the heart, we can study the clues that we can accumulate on the EKG and the echo, and then incorporate the other features we've been sitting on, which is what does it mean that he has weakness, that he has fatigue? What does it mean that he has a prominent family history? What does it mean that he's he's drinking uh, uh, more than a healthy amount? Um, and I think all those things will help us make a lot of progress. But I think um, like you, um, my initial thoughts were, hmm, with Anasarca, that's mostly kidney. With the exam, uh, it's mostly liver, and now it's mostly heart, which uh, in real life would make me uh, lose utter confidence in myself as I'm taking care of this patient. But hopefully, we'll finally get well. Hopefully, we'll get some momentum in a linear fashion going forward. Otherwise, uh, it might be more than an hour of conversation. All right, I'll hand mic to you. Yeah, it's a great discussion. Uh, we can now talk about the echo findings, what the Roy Apoquot and ultrasound showed, and what the paracentesis showed as well. So let's start with the echo first. Uh, on the echo, his left ventricular ejection fraction was 25 to 29%. His LV was dilated with global hypokinesis. He had normal wall thickness. His LA was dilated. RV size and function were normal. 
his RVSP was elevated at 40 uh, millimeter mercury. There was no pericardial effusion, no valvular abnormalities. Going through his right upper quadrant ultrasound, it did show cirrhotic liver morphology with moderate volume abdominal ascites and a dilated main portal vein with hepatopetal flow. We did do a diagnostic paracentesis and I can share with you the results of that. On the paracentesis, the fluid albumin was 0.8, total protein was 2.2, RBCs were 3,000, nucleated cells were 101, mostly lymphocytes, and we calculated a SAG, which was three. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. This is very, very helpful information. All right, I mean, we're getting closer and closer and closer, at least understanding what's going on. What do you think? So interesting, very interesting, uh, like ultrasound uh, findings. Uh, the fact that his LV is so profoundly affected and we have such severe LV dysfunction and his, the fact that we're now, the only thing that I'm seeing right now on exam is just diffuse edema instead of besides any kind of pulmonary edema, no or crackles or anything, surprising. But patients hide their fluid in a lot of different body cavities. He, I guess, is just prone to um, hiding it, not in his lungs. Um, but that combined with, the ultrasound showing cirrhosis and, you know, dilated main portal vein with hepatopetal flow. So we have now two organs that are profoundly affected. Cirrhosis, I mean, we have a liver that's cirrhotic and we have a heart that is just not pumping well. It's just reduced ejection fraction, We're looking at a half-pref picture. And then and combined with that, we have, I'll be, thank you so much for calculating the SAG, by the way, because I was trying to do the math. I'm like, how do I do this? But uh, the SAG has come down. Sorry, what was, the SAG was three. So we're already thinking in terms of our differential, the SAG being greater than three uh, or greater than 1.1, we're not, not thinking about other things such as like nephrotic syndrome or inflammatory conditions like peritoneal mets or um, any kind of like infectious things that can cause ascites like tuberculosis or something. But a SAG being that profoundly high at three already takes us down. Is this sort of portal hypertension, um, or is this something else? Um, portal hypertension due to liver issues or portal hypertension due to non-liver issues? And with, uh, I believe it was a total protein of 2.2. We're looking at cirrhosis primarily. I would be interested to see exactly, um, but at the same time, in the context of his heart, I mean, his heart function being so severely affected, I can't completely rule out that this is all the cirrhosis. That's the only thing that I should be focusing on. I think what right now we're looking at is an encompassing picture um, that a sort of an encompassing constellate diagnosis that has cirrhosis in its one of its sequelae, has cardiomyopathy in its sequelae, has possibly diabetes in its sequelae, um, has familial inheritance possibly in its sequelae. And when we look at it through those lens, is that I know that we, we live in the real world, possibly he may have like three or four different diagnoses and I'm anchoring and I'm trying to fit, make everything fit into a pretty little box, but this is morning report, this is what we do. So when we look at it through those lens in terms of cirrhosis, cardiomyopathy, um, new onset diabetes and uh, familial inheritance possibly, the differential just becomes very, very low. It just, I mean, it really narrows our scope down. And now we can start thinking about, okay, specific diagnostic text that we may want to do um, to rule in things or to rule out things. In the real world setting, this gentleman is still going to get all the workup that goes into patients having cirrhosis. So he's going to get, you know, hepatitis studies. He's going to get all those other things. But do I think that's what's happening? Possibly not. Um, and when we think about, a condition that involves all those other things, things such as like hereditary hemochromatosis that affects, you know, the pituitary gland, affects the pancreas, affects the liver, possibly affects the heart, is inherited. So he's in sort of the right age population. Those things are much higher on the differential, but I'm still sending out, you know, all the cirrhosis workup, including in hepatitis labs, alpha-1 antitrypsin, Wilson's, all those other things. Um, man, I'm possibly, uh, I mean, I would like to see, you know, iron labs, ferritin, and I will most likely be moving towards possibly like um, liver biopsy if the uh, diagnosis is not clear cut. 
Uh, I think that's absolutely superb. I, you know, what I love most is how you frame the problem. And I think that when you framed it so well, I think the uh, solution starts to stare at you. And I think you, by seeing that the patient has a SAG greater than 1.1, you've confirmed the patient has portal hypertension. 90% of portal hypertension in the U.S. is from cirrhosis. A small fraction is from the heart. The fact that the total protein is not greater than 2.5 reduces the likelihood that that ascites is cardiogenic in origin. So you know the liver is in inherently involved, but you also know the heart's involved based on the echo. So you're making a differential diagnosis for a patient who has heart and liver issues at the same time. And that differential diagnosis should, before you start to think of underlying diagnoses causing both, to recognize the very practical reality that one causes the other all the time. You can have heart failure of any condition cause cardiac cirrhosis, and you can have cirrhosis of any condition cause portal pulmonary hypertension and high output cardiac failure. So the directions can actually be causal between the organs. But if you're trying to draw the arrows to an underlying diagnosis, there's only three conditions that do this on a regular basis. Alcohol, iron overload, and amyloid. And in fact, it's three substances, alcohol, iron, amyloid, those three things. And so here you might say, well, wait, what's stopping you from implicating the alcohol? This person's drinking a decent amount. And the, the problem with that hypothesis is whenever you're thinking alcohol, you're trying to connect it to a heart and liver syndrome, you should pause and wonder if it's being connected by thiamine or thiamine deficiency or beriberi, but also by iron overload. Only 20% of patients with hereditary hemochromatosis develop iron overload. And guess who those 20% are? Those 20% are often people who have a secondary hit. And what are the most common secondary hits? Hepatitis C and alcohol use. He's 44. He's on the younger side for manifesting such profound iron overload, if it is in fact iron overload. So his alcohol use is probably a large contributor to that if that hypothesis pans out. So not to minimize the contribution of that. I agree with you. I think the regular old workup of this patient is what's in order. and But that regular old workup includes uh, an iron panel, which I, I would be eagerly awaiting in this patient because it also explains his fatigue and his musculoskeletal symptoms. Uh, Good body aches too, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Really, really nice job. We'll see, you know, we'll see where, where it takes us, but I think the pre-test probability of iron load, uh, iron overload is pretty high right now. All right, Yelly, I'll mic to you, my friend. That's great. So we'll go through the results of the secondary cirrhosis workup. So we got a hepatitis panel, uh, pan negative. Alpha-1 antitrypsin levels were also within normal limits. Seroloplasmin was also normal. Negative ANA, anti-smooth muscle antibody, anti-mitochondrial antibody, all were negative. So moving on to the iron panel results, ferritin was 5,600. Iron was 177. TIBC was 181. Transferrin was 130. And iron sat was 98%. We went on to get an MRI liver as well which showed and confirmed cirrhotic liver morphology with nodular contour and increased density. There were no focal hepatic lesions. There was mild splenomegaly, dilated portal vein and large volume ascites. All right, what would you do next, my friend? Your hypothesis has panned out. You're getting some momentum. How would you uh, proceed? What would be your next step, you think? So looking at the cirrhosis uh, workup that we did, things obviously that are jumping out are the ferritin that's sky high, uh, greater than 5,000. And we have obviously an MRI findings of cirrhosis uh, of the liver. Uh, thankfully, no hepatic lesions right now. Uh, so the way that I, I guess I would treat this patient is you have to treat both the sort of presenting signs and symptoms and the sort of local or the more acute diagnoses that are causing those issues, so such as the cirrhosis, uh, the heart failure. So this gentleman has earned himself the normal things that we would do for any patient with cirrhosis. So volume management, uh, diuretics, 
Lasix, spironolactone, uh, making sure that he gets in regular in the EGD if he has evidence of portal hypertension, and making sure that we're doing the Arbear seal screening, uh, making sure that uh, with the asterixis, we're making sure that he's having bowel movements, he's not going into a hepatic encephalopathic, encephalopathic state. And then along with that, making sure that we're managing his heart failure, possibly that we're being aggressive with GDMT, making sure that he's leaving the hospital, being on an ACE, ARB, RNE, beta blocker, MRA, et cetera. Um, and then seeing him as an outpatient to see if he needs any de device therapy. Um, but we also, at the same time, while we're managing cirrhosis and the heart failure, is to um, think about managing hereditary, possibly right now. I mean, I'm putting all my buckets right now in her hereditary hemochromatosis, but managing that as a condition. Um, so in my mind, the typical things that we do for patients with hereditary hemochromatosis, of course, are sort of things like phlebotomies, making sure that we can somehow decrease the iron overload or the iron burden in his body. Um, I just haven't seen enough patients to know whether uh, we can possibly reverse any of the sequelae of uh, iron overload that's happened now. Um, optimistic me says, yes, we may see some improvement <laughs> yeah. with medications and phlebotomy. Uh, pessimistic me says, uh, don't count on it. Um, but he's earned himself, um, you know, he's earned himself a very close cirrhosis management, heart failure management, very close follow with both GI and cardiology at this point. And of course, really, uh, I mean, he already has children at this point, right? Um, I apologize. Yeah. yeah, he had yeah. some children, making sure that his families are well screened uh, so that we can, unfortunately, we saw him at 44 years old, making sure that if his children are younger, that they're getting screened for this sort of the HFV gene or uh, anything that we can prevent these kind of things happening in his uh, loved ones. Yeah, I think that I agree with you. I think diagnostically, the next step would be to get the, get the HFV gene. And if it is homozygous for C2A2Y, which is the highest risk gene variant for um, the most common cause of hereditary hemochromatosis, um, that does not confirm he has hemochromatosis. To, to, not to disappoint, um, if even if he has a genetic profile perfect for hemochromatosis, he has possible hemochromatosis because alcohol use may be the driver of his entire iron overload. So the only way you can confirm that he has hereditary hemochromatosis is to see what happens to his iron profile after he uh, um, uh, stops using alcohol because the vast majority of that patient, the patients with that genotype will not get iron overload. And the trigger analysis in here is a very big one. However, I think you can make the leap of faith that the amount of alcohol he's using probably wouldn't cause this degree of dysfunction from the alcohol alone. But I think the first step is to work on the trigger and to discuss options and work about um, his alcohol use. And I imagine that'll be a big, big contributor. So the most we can do in this case in a patient with a risk factor for iron overload independent of the genetics is to say that he is at risk of iron overload with no additional contribution. But we don't know how much of it is occurring spontaneously in his body and how much of it is being augmented by the alcohol use. Uh, so I think that's a, uh, that's a really uh, interesting dimension uh, that the penetrance of hereditary hemochromatocytosis is only 20%, which uh, exposes the reality of triggers and secondary phenomenon to the big, big, big spotlight. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll pass the mic to you, Alika, to tell us what, what you all did next diagnostically. Yeah, so we did pursue genetic testing. He underwent genetic testing for the HFE protein coding gene, which revealed a homozygous C282Y mutation which is diagnostic for hereditary hemochromocytosis. So he, we managed him in a multidisciplinary approach. We had GI, endocrinology, hematology, genetics, and cardiology all involved in the case. It was also humbling to appreciate the systemic manifestations of hemochromatosis with the diabetes, the arthralgias and body aches and fatigue that he has, the multi-organ involvement, cirrhosis, half breath, um, involvement of the heart and the liver. And the importance of just keeping a broad differential and having a systematic approach to the problem. I think you presented this case perfectly in such an engaging way and really was a topsy turvy journey, uh, ultimately um, landing on what um, uh, what Fahim emphasized in the exam, which what if it's both? What if it's two organs? And it turns out, yeah, you're right. It's both the heart and the liver. I love that you were suspicious of hemochromatosis from the very, very early on, but also admire more so how you were focused on trying to understand the problem first before really zeroing on it. 
Uh, I'm curious what your uh, reflections are before we hand the mic back to Deborah and Yaz to uh, finish the session. Um, I think it's, like you said, trying to keep a broad enough differential uh, while we have, we're still in data collecting phase, it's, it's extremely important uh, so that we don't get anchored in any one diagnosis. Um, it's so easy to just focus on like, it's all the heart, it's all the liver. Um, but once you realize, once you kind of like take a step back, understand that there is a broader picture to the, all this, um, it makes, as we saw after we got, you know, the history, the lab, the exam finding the lab, that things were a little bit more clear so that we were very confident in saying that, you know, it's possibly, you know, these three things. Um, People make fun of uh, internal medicine folks all the time that we just love to yeah. sort of create differentials and then say, eh, we'll see. Uh, but I think it's it's important because medicine is extremely complex. Um, our patients do not fit into those wonderful one paragraph clinical vignettes that we see on our staff yeah. exams and other board exams. And uh, real life patients, um, they can have more than one diagnosis or they can have one diagnosis that's manifesting in a hundred different ways. I think that's so well said. Um, I can see that you're going to make an outstanding chief resident and teach a lot and a, and a great physician. I'm really, really excited for you. And um, I knew we could figure it out with just talking with you guys alone, um, that that a cardiologist and a GI chief resident would merge together and 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 uh, present a case of heart and GI. Uh, it, it was there. The clue was there. I'm, I'm bummed I didn't pick up on it early, but it's not too surprising that a diagnosis bridges those two really uh, beautiful words, worlds. Um, but yeah, I'll pass the mic to Deborah and Yaz to take it from here. Thank you, Afeem. That was a lot of fun. And thank you, like, thank you. for a really cool case. Amazing. Great discussion. It was uh, a really nice case. Thank you so much. I want to ask if we have someone else from the program that we did introduce in the beginning. I want to say sorry about that. I believe yeah. Dr. Philip and Dr. Aham. Phil, you enter yourself. Hey everyone, I'm Phil. I'm one of the uh, chief residents with Cody and uh, just love seeing Lucky and Fahim present this case and discuss the reasoning. And we're just so proud of y'all. Really uh, love the clinical reasoning, deep dive into common problems, lots of nuance. That was amazing. We really appreciate the opportunity for us to kind of showcase our people here. So thank y'all. I don't know if there's anybody else to introduce. Um, I don't think so. I think some people uh, hopped on, but then are off now. Yeah, if Dr. Cory you wanna talk a little bit about the program, give us an overview. He was having a really big smile during the case. I think he's really uh proud of the residents. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it was just like such a exciting case and just hearing everybody talk about it was like really nice to listen to. Um, you know, especially from like sort of the perspective of someone knowing the final diagnosis. I, I think like the journey was like amazing to watch. Um, just a little bit about Baylor. I think uh, Aleki and Fahim kind of talked about it previously and did a great job of describing it. But, um, you know, essentially it's a large academic program located here in Houston in the Texas Medical Center. Um, we have about 180 residents at any point in time between the categorical residents. We have an MD Anderson track, um, uh, an accelerated research pathway, a genetics pathway, and then also um, a whole host of prelim interns as well. Um, we rotate in four independent like healthcare systems. I think Alekia kind of described them previously, but just to recap it, um, we we work at Bentov, which is our county system. Um, we work at the VA, which is one of the largest uh, VAs in the country. Um, we work at St. Luke's, which is our private sort of uh, tertiary quaternary referral center. And then we work at MD Anderson, which is um, one of the largest uh, comprehensive cancer networks in the country. And, you know, it's an honor to work at all these hospitals and it only increases and diversifies our skills as physicians and exposes us to a whole host of um, different patients and diseases. Not only that, I think, you know, I think what we're proud about is we're serving the community of Houston. 
Houston is a diverse city and depending on sort of where you read and sort of what metrics you use, it's one of the most diverse cities in the country and the fourth largest city in the country as well. And, you know, I think we have the honor of serving this global community here in Houston and we're so proud to do so. Um, I think other strengths of our program are sort of um, the clinical rigor and the ability to create such like competent like clinicians like coming out of residency and then also having access to the Texas Medical Center which are exposes you know the residents to um you know everything under the sun that's going on in medicine and I think makes them better physicians and then make them better specialists in the future um so with that I I'm happy to answer any questions and I think Alekia Fahim Phil if you want to chime in too as well well, I'll just add that I think this case is emblematic of cases we see every day, every week, and how we went about presenting it with Alekia and how Fahim went about discussing it represents the kind of clinical reasoning we have here at Baylor. I'm just, uh, we just love our clinical training here at the four different sites. And so uh, that's kind of my plug for, for Baylor. I do have a question. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about the boot camps you have for interns and the health year boot camps. Like, what are those about? Like, the upper level boot camps, sorry. And what are like those about? The day, like, do, you, do they give like, what, uh, like a guideline of how the hospital works? What does, well, how does that work? Because I think it's very interesting that a program is investing this time to help their interns to like get into like the workflow and everything. Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, I think one of the hardest parts about medicine is the transitions that you experience, you know, one from medical school to residency, and then one as a intern to an upper level resident where you're now supervising and in charge of, you know, soon to be interns. And I think, you know, uh, affording like the time to uh, you know, learn and teach about these transitions is really important. So for our intern boot camp, we have a few weeks or a week or so before, you know, intern year starts. And essentially that's just to orient interns to the hospital and then sort of start getting their cogs turning again after a long kind of uh, prolonged break of like what fourth year medical uh, school is. And then I think the transition from you know, first year to second year is really important because now you're becoming a leader, you're becoming, um, you know, an upper level resident. So the upper level boot camp is what we do at the end of intern year and focuses on transitioning you as an intern to now a leader who will lead their team um, as part of, uh, as an upper level. So it includes both like a leadership workshop as well as simulation sessions um, after that. Well, that's amazing. Like, it's really nice uh, to be able to do this this transition smoothly. So, yeah, Deb, do you have any other questions? Yeah, like um, normally here, we always ask for the programs about research. If you all have opportunity to do research uh, uh, during residency, it's a question that we receive a lot. Sure, I think, um, yeah, I think that's a great question. I think, you know, research is really important, not only for, um, you know, exploring areas that you're interested in and passionate about, but also, um, you know, you know, furthering your sort of portfolio in terms of applying for fellowship or your career afterwards. And I think one of the biggest perks about Baylor is, you know, we're located in the medical center. We rotate at four different hospitals. So there's going to be faculty doing something that, you know, you are interested in. So there's a lot of niche faculty and the the number of faculty allow residents to uh, work with a whole bunch of people. So the majority of our residents do research um, in some capacity, and most of it is clinical research. But what I also love about Baylor is, um, you know, we're a large like academic institution. We have the medical school here. So we do have a lot of opportunities for educational research. And then we also have, in addition to the five chief residents, we have three uh, QI chief residents as well. So we have a very large footprint in the QI sort of um, world and uh, offer a lot of QI based research as well. It's good to know, like, honestly, thank you for all that information because I know that many people are very like research oriented. And uh, if this is a question for all of you, like, Anybody that wants to to answer this is it PGY three is it chief is it PGY two? Um, if you have encountered any challenge during residency, because I see that you have a lot a lot of support, but if there's any challenge, for example, like in the city or like adapting after a um, bootcamp something. 
Yeah, I think that, I mean, I don't know whether Cody or Phil or anybody else wants to chime in after I say something, but, you know, personally, I know um, of many residents who've run into issues during, uh, you know, the past two and a half years that I've been a resident and my, I'm my, I'm myself also, you know, um, my father had a coronary artery bypass graft surgery. So he had a full on open heart cabbage procedure. This was during my second year. And the chiefs at that time were just incredibly accommodating in terms of letting me have time off. Um, and they were, you know, checking in afterwards even. So there is, Baylor is one of the largest programs that you will encounter in terms of maternal medicine residency. But the beauty of Baylor um, is that ever since I was a medical student here, is that there is a feeling of family also, um, that despite there being, you know, 30, 40 people in one specific class and maybe almost up to 100 or more uh, residents over, you know, PGY 1 to 3, um, there is a sense of closer-knit family. Uh, so, their the attendings, um, the residents, everybody sort of is understanding in terms of what we're going through, and the fam- the program in itself has a robust um, backup system, so that if you are going through something or if you need additional support, uh, that there's always somebody that you can talk to, either your advisor or another faculty member that you're close with, or if you need some time away from work um, for any on for any reason. Uh, that you can confidentially um, approach either a chief medical resident or another faculty member and obtain that time off and be assured that while you're off, your clinical services are being covered by another resident. I mean, we have a system called Jeopardy. I mean, I w- which is during a week during our ambulatory services where we can be called in to cover for an inpatient or like an ICU kind of rotation. I w- myself was on uh, Jeopardy uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So I was called in during Christmas, Christmas Eve time uh, to cover in for an ICU resident. And that is the expectation that when our residents are going through something, we can always pick up uh, slack without them feeling guilty, without them feeling as if they're being a burden, because that's what, at the end of the day, um, if we don't have each other, what else do we have? That's really impressive and really nice to hear about. And and I, I see that you can, you will be an amazing chief resident next year. And listening to a program that is like family, is very helpful, especially in residency, which is very, very hard and like for trainees. And uh, uh, last but not least, would you like to ask something else, Deborah? Just be mindful of the time. Like with us, oh, oh, Mario, do you have a question? Yeah, Mario. Yeah, sorry, if you don't mind. I had a question for Alikia. Um, I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the the, the couples match. I, I don't know how, how was your experience with that. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, great question. I think that Houston as a city is a great place to couples match. Like Cody mentioned, the Texas Medical Center is the largest medical center. We have four big hospital systems located here in Houston itself. So it's a great place to couples match. Um, when I was applying, I reached out to Baylor as a program saying that I am couples matching uh, and the program itself was very supportive in that it reached out to the counterpart of my my partner's program uh, in terms of getting an interview and facilitating the whole couples match process. So yeah, multiple factors. One is that there are four big hospital systems, so more chance of couples matching here. And the program itself has been very supportive of supporting people who are wanting to couples match. And there's been there are several residents in my year and in the years above and below who have couples matched here successfully. And taking a step further, on top of supporting us in terms of helping us match together in the same city, the program has also been very supportive in terms of helping with things like getting us vacation together, supporting leave requests together. So it's been overall a very good experience and supportive experience in terms of uh, having a partner who is also doing residency at the same time. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing with us. We we passed a little bit of the time, but we can do a last question. If anyone, if each one of you want to share a little bit about Houston, something that we should know about it, how is the city, and then we can end the session. Sure, I guess I can I can start off. Uh, as someone who is born and raised here, I think I'm a little biased about the city, um, but I, I, I'll leave the majority of it to Lekia and Fahim, but I'll mention the weather. 
as I imagine most people would be interested in that. Um, Houston is like a pretty uh, like nice weather if you like if you do not like the cold. So I think uh, right now it's like sort of the chilliest it's been all year and it's like in the 40s. Um, but for most part, it's like really nice during the spring, uh, winter and uh, fall. The summers, though, are incredibly hot. Um, this past summer, I think, uh, averaged like the hottest summer in, in Houston for a while. And it was about uh, it would like above 100 every uh, degrees Fahrenheit every day, averaging 110s for weeks. Um, so uh, that's kind of like the climate about Houston, just so everybody knows. Um, there's a lot of other great parts of Houston as well, but I'll kind of leave that to Lucky and Fahim. Yeah, so I, I mean, Lucky, I probably can say more about this in the sense that having the experience of living in, in another city or in, even in another country. I mean, I was born in Pakistan. Um, for that, I mean, we briefly stayed with my aunt and uncle in New York. Then I moved to Galveston and then been in, been in Houston ever since, you know, um, high school, uh, honestly. Well, what I can tell you is that Houston is is extremely large. Houston is large. That's absolutely true. But at the same time, there are places in Houston that just feel like home, feel like community. And overall, in its city, I can confidently tell you that even the place where I was born in Karachi, like when I go back and I go back regularly, it it just does not feel like home the way that Houston does now. Uh, the diversity that you will see in terms of the people that you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, both inside and outside of work. It's something that you may take for granted when you first come here, but when you go somewhere else and you find it missing, you find missing, you know, the diversity of people that you see, the people that you talk to, the experiences that these people have. I mean, it's something that you just crave and you can, I can only get that by coming back to Houston. And then on top of that, of course, you know, Houston is an, is an amazing city if you really want to, um, dive into the food scene. We don't have any Michelin star restaurants, um, but uh, we have a tremendous amount of cuisine from a lot of different places and it's authentic cuisine. So if you're excited about that, then um, that's another really calling, great calling part of Houston. But what I can tell you is that I've been in a lot of different cities, um, but Houston's home. And I can tell you that I have re residents right now that I've worked with who've only been here for the last Two and a half years, you know, while they're in residency, and in just in just those short, you know, couple of short years, use they consider Houston home too. So I can say that we will, we will love to have y'all, uh, but be warned that if you guys come here, you guys will probably not end up leaving because you guys will love it here so much. Well, I don't have much to add after all of that. I can agree with the great food scene that's here, and as Fahim was saying, very authentic, uh, especially moving from the UK, London. I I guess there's big shoes to fill in terms of wanting a good food scene. And I think Houston definitely lives up to that. Uh, great diversity of food, authentic. And another thing that I would just add to everything that was said is how affordable the city is. It's mm -hmm. one of the largest cities in the country, but it come it doesn't come with the price tags that come in other big cities. It's a very affordable place. Uh, rents are... Rents are cheap. Uh, you can, I know residents in our year who bought houses as well. So your resident salary takes you further than it would in other cities. So I think the affordability factor is an important thing to, to highlight. Um, talking about other things to do in the city, uh, there's multiple large city parks. And as Cody was saying, the weather's great. So you can definitely go on a stroll, walk around, do some trails, hikes around the city. So just generally has a really nice vibe to the city. Thank you so much for the insight. And again, being very mindful of your time, we are very grateful that you join us today, that you presented this amazing case. Uh, Dr. Cody, Dr. Fahim, Dr. Alikia, and everybody else from Baylor Residency. If you ever want to come back and present another amazing place, please do so. Thank you for this amazing Saturday afternoon. Um, again, we enjoyed so much learning with you. And thank you so much for having us. We really uh, enjoyed this as well. Have a good day, everybody, and Happy New Year. Have a good day. See you later. Thank you, y'all.